Welcome to Data Communications and Networking. In this course, we're going to go through the fundamentals of data communications and networking. We'll start off by establishing a basic model for a data circuit and then some standard circuit configurations and along the way explain LANs and WANs and routers and packets. We'll go through the critical ideas of packets and frames and how those two things are related. And we'll finish off with a summary, if you will, of the first three courses looking at the network cloud and why people always draw pictures of networks as clouds and what's actually going on inside that cloud. And what we'll end up seeing is that there are three basic services from telecommunication service providers, dedicated lines, phone calls, and bandwidth on demand services, also known as full period services, circuit switching, and packet switching. We covered circuit switching in course one, and we covered dedicated lines in course two. In this course, we're going to cover the ideas of packets. And what we'll end up seeing in the last chapter is that there are three kinds of network services. There are three kinds of equipment that are used to provide these. Data communications as we know it today pretty much got started in the 1940s and one of the seminal events was a publication of a paper in the Bell System Technical Journal by a fellow by the name of Claude Shannon and the title of his paper was A Mathematical Theory of Communication and this was the beginning of what we know today as information theory. Now we're not here to study information theory, we're here to look at the practical implementation of these ideas. But there are a couple of concepts that are useful to keep in mind. One is that when you send somebody an email, that's not the objective of what you're doing. The purpose of sending somebody an email is to communicate a thought to their brain, right? That's one idea. The other idea is that we only have real physical things over which we could communicate our thoughts, like copper wires or pieces of glass or the air or space. These are all perfectly good real things. The way that we ended up organizing things was as a two-step process. First, we take our thoughts and code them into ones and zeros. So there's a coding step. That's the first step. Then the second step is a hardware step. We have some hardware that we put on the physical real stuff over which we want to communicate our thoughts. And this hardware is the stuff that knows how to represent ones and zeros. And you always have to have the same hardware at each end of the physical thing over which we're trying to communicate these thoughts. So try to keep that in mind as we're going through this story. It's always a two-step process, coding your thoughts into ones and zeros, and then representing those on the physical medium using some hardware. To get started, I'd like to introduce a model for discussing a data circuit at its very lowest level. This is a model that comes from an organization that used to be called the CCITT, Le Comité Consultatif International de Téléphone et de Telegraph, or the International Consultative Committee on Telephone and Telegraph. They changed their name, and now they're called the Telecommunications Standards Sector of the International Telecommunications Union, or something silly like that. This is an international treaty organization, and all of the countries that sign the treaty have a right to send representatives, and they have big plenary sessions, and they have working groups, and study groups, and technical subcommittees, and sometimes they come up with things like standards for how to build a national telecommunications network, ISDN for example, and how to format the data to go over circuits to get onto the network and on and on. Now I have a friend who was on one of these technical subcommittees and he claimed that it stood not for Le Comité Consultatif International de Telephone et de Telegraph, but rather for 
coffee and croissant interspersed with technical trivia. Because he claimed that what you do is you get onto one of these technical subcommittees and then every spring at your employer's expense, this is a key point, you get to go to Geneva. And you stay in a nice hotel on the edge of Lake Geneva and the meetings don't start early. They start at 10 o'clock. So you have a nice leisurely breakfast, reading the paper, having a second cup of coffee. And then you go down to the room where this technical subcommittee meets and they've got the tables all set up in an oval arrangement with name cards for each person on the committee. And the way it works is that the North Americans propose something and then the Europeans vote against it in a block and tell them how stupid they are. And then everybody goes into the other room and has coffee and croissant. And you do this every day for three weeks and then come home. Now, he told me when we were in senior year high school that this is what he wanted to do for a living. And there he is. He's on the committee circuit. You have to admire that sort of vision in life. I have no patience for stuff like that. But one thing that these people brought us that is useful is a model for discussing a circuit at its lowest level. At the heart of our model is the physical medium. And this is some sort of real physical thing over which we're going to try to communicate some thoughts. This could be anything. It could be copper wires. They could be twisted together. There could be one inside the other, coaxial copper wires. It could be a piece of fiber optics. It could be the air. It could be the space. Whatever. This is some sort of real physical thing over which we're going to try to communicate thoughts. At each end of the physical medium, we have to put data circuit terminating equipment. Don't blame me. It was the CCITT that omitted the T in this. This is data circuit terminating equipment. And this is the hardware that we have to put at each end of the physical medium. This is the stuff that knows how to represent ones and zeros on the physical medium. The idea is that if you put a one in here, a one is going to pop out over there. If you put a zero in here, a zero is going to pop out of there. And for each type of physical medium, there are specific kinds of circuit terminating equipment that we put on it that know how to do this. And you have to have the same stuff at both ends. At the ends of the story, we've got the data terminal equipment. When we say terminal, that's the Latin word terminus. What we mean is the stuff at the ends of the story. Historically, what we were doing was dumb terminal to remote host computing. However, a printer is a perfectly good type of terminal equipment. Try not to lose sight of the fact that what we're attempting to do here is to communicate information from one end to another. This is the model that most people use to discuss a circuit at its very lowest level. What I'd like to do now is to go through the model and uh, look at the different pieces and give some examples to put this into context and use it as an excuse to introduce everything we're going to talk about. Let's start with the stuff at the ends, the terminal equipment. Historically, what we were doing was dumb terminal to remote host computing. Dumb terminals are also called ASCII terminals. Uh, sometimes they're called VDTs, video display terminals. If you wanted to sound like Buck Rogers, you could call it a CRT, a cathode ray tube display device. Cathode rays. I've never really liked the term VDT though. It always sounds kind of diseased somehow. I prefer to call them dumb terminals. Why do we call them dumb terminals? Well, what do you get if you get a dumb terminal? If you open the box and put it on the table, what have you got? A keyboard and a screen. And that's it. You don't get anything else. And this device is set up so that if you press a button on the keyboard, it spits a code out the back saying which button you just pressed. And if it sees a code coming in the back, it puts the corresponding character on the screen. That's all it does. It doesn't do anything else. 
Sometimes these were called ASCII terminals because that's the American standard code for telling somebody else which button you just pressed on your keyboard. Now what's the difference between a dumb terminal and an intelligent terminal? What do you get if you get an intelligent terminal? Well, you get a keyboard, a screen, a processor, and memory. Don't tell anybody that's the definition of a computer. Input, output, processing, and storage. Those are the four elements of a computer. So an intelligent terminal is capable of doing all of the functions of a dumb terminal, but it's also capable of doing local processing and local storage inside the terminal. This is a radical new idea. Does anybody remember when computers were first invented? An organization like an insurance company, they would have one computer. And it would be sitting in the computer room that had glass windows all the way around and acolytes and dressed in white robes who ministered to the computer all day, changing tapes and putting your printout in pigeonholes and you'd have to go over and pick it up. Back then, an organization would have one computer with 300 dumb terminals hanging off of it. And if you wanted to use the computer, you had to do time sharing with everybody else. First, you get to use it for 10 milliseconds, and you have to get off, and somebody else can use it for 10 milliseconds. And the IT department would charge your departmental budget based on how many processor cycles you'd used that month. Well, things have changed. Now everybody has a computer sitting on their desk. But we certainly wouldn't want to give a copy of a shared database to everybody sitting on their desk. Well, let's think of an insurance company. They have a million customers and they've got 2,500 customer service representatives. Now they're going to have a customer database and if you want to think of it this way it would have columns like last name, first name, policy number, start date, expiration date, claims, you know, that whole stuff and there would be one row for each customer in the database if you want to think of it that way. Can you imagine the trouble we would get into if we gave every one of those 2500 customer service reps a copy of the customer database sitting on their desktop computer and let them make changes to their own copy? Can you imagine the trouble we'd have trying to keep these things all concurrent so they all said the same thing? No, you don't want to do anything like that. What you want to do is get a computer that can do honking fast database searches, like an IBM mainframe for example, put the customer database on that, and also give it some software that lets it talk to lots of people at the same time. This is called server software. And then what we do is we take the desktop computers and load what's called client software on those and then connect all the desktop computers to this central database server using copper wires inside a building. And the set of copper wires is called a LAN. Then when a customer service representative wants to get information about a customer, they fire up the client software on their desktop PC and they enter a request for the information that they want. And then we send the request over the copper wires to the centralized database server. It does a search and grabs the raw information and sends that back as an answer and we might have to do several inquiry responses to get the whole story. Meanwhile, the desktop computer's client software is storing this up and doing processing on it to create a GUI, a graphical user interface that then pops up on the screen. Client server computing. The whole idea is to have centralized resources, but distributed processing. How does a redwood tree pump water 300 feet up into the air? Does it have a honking big pump at the base of the tree? No, it's got billions of tiny little pumps. If you had to go buy a dumb terminal, would you actually go buy a dumb terminal? Do they still even make those things, like VT100s from DEC? Well, I don't know, maybe they do, but what most normal people would do would be to get a PC and run a terminal emulation program on it. Like, for example, 
Microsoft Hyper Terminal. And this is a little software program that when you run it, if you press a key on your keyboard, your computer spits a code out the back saying which button you just pressed. It doesn't normally do this, only when you run this special software program. And this is called emulation, where you run a software program to make one thing take on the attributes of another. Who was, past tense, was the market leader in selling client software to turn your desktop PC into a client for doing client server computing over a LAN? Hint, their head office is in Utah. Ever heard of Novell Netware before? People used to use uh, things like Novell Netware and Banyan Vines and so forth as the client software. Of course, you had to buy the server software as well. And then you could have like network drives and shared printers and things like that. What happened to that business? Resistance is futile. You will be assimilated. Microsoft included all the things you need to do to do network drives and shared printers for free in Windows XP. So you can set up a, a network printer and a shared hard drive on a little LAN in three minutes with Windows XP. You don't have to go buy some software from some other company anymore. One other kind of terminal that's worth mentioning is a point of sale terminal. If you go to Home Depot and buy a widget and take that up to the cash register, well, that isn't a cash register, it's a point of sale terminal. And what's going on there is somebody put a sticker with a barcode on the widget, and then we scan the barcode at the point of sale terminal. It's connected to a computer over in the corner of the building. So we send the code of the item over to the computer in the corner of the building, and it sends back a textual description of the item and its price and probably decrements the inventory system at the same time. Client server computing, right? They're keeping all of the prices on a price server over in the corner of the building. Another example would be if you purchased gasoline using a credit card. And this wasn't a pay at the pump station. They still had a person doing the credit card authorizations. So you pump the gas, hand the person your card, now, somebody at the credit card factory glued a piece of magnetic tape about that long onto the back of your credit card. And there's a bunch of stuff on there, like your name, your account number, the expiry date of your card, a provisory credit limit, what bank you belong to, what language you like to speak. So you hand the person your card, and what they've got in their terminal is a magnetic stripe reader. So they swipe the card through that, and there's a keypad on it. They punch in the amount of purchase and maybe some other stuff, and then they press send. This thing has a built-in modem in it, and it's connected onto the public telephone network. So it goes off hook and goes beep, 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 and then a modem at the bank's payment processing division answers the phone. Those two modems then go shh, shh, shh to negotiate just exactly how they're going to represent ones and zeros on a phone line, because there are lots of ways of doing that. And once we have this all set up, we transfer the card number, its expiry date, maybe the card security code, the merchant ID, and the amount of purchase, and we get back about six bytes with an authorization code, a result code, and a reason code. And then the bank's payment processing division hangs up on us so somebody else can call in and do a credit authorization. And meanwhile, this point of sale terminal has a little printer integrated in it, and it prints the bill out on some paper that you have to sign. Notice in this scenario, it takes longer to set up the data circuit than it does to actually communicate the data. Let's say you went to some place in the middle of nowhere, like a Barstow, California, and maybe they didn't even get touch tone, they got pulse dialing. So you pump the gas, hand the person your card, they swipe it, punch in the amount of purchase and press send, and then the telephone line interface on the point of sale terminal starts going click, 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 while you're standing there waiting. It could take 30 seconds to set up the communication circuit, 
and then 10 milliseconds to transmit the data, and then the bank hangs up on us. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a type of network service offering from telecommunication service providers where we could set the connection up in advance and it was priced in such a way that the bank wouldn't keep hanging up on us after every transaction so that when you wanted to do an authorization, there wasn't this big delay waiting to set up the circuit every time. Yes, it would be nice. And that's called a bandwidth on demand service or a packet network from the phone company. And we're going to go through that whole story in course number four. So that's the stuff at the ends. What about the stuff in the middle? Well, we tend to call these things circuits. Now, where did the term circuit come from? Well, it's French. They got it from Latin, but English-speaking people got it from French. And a circuit in French, this is a racetrack. Presumably, the reason why we call things circuits is because we used to always be talking about copper wires and electrons go around in a circuit or in a loop on copper wires. Now the term is also used to apply to radio and fiber optics as well, and things don't go around in circles on fiber optics. So it's kind of a notional term, meaning just a connection from one place to another. We characterize the way that we represent information on the circuits into analog and digital. And as we saw in course number one, we use analog techniques to represent information on the local loop in the public telephone network. And this means that we put a voltage in that case on the wires that's a direct representation of the sound pressure waves coming out of the speaker's throat. And the thing that we're changing is the voltage on the wires as the representation. Cable television and any kind of radio you can think of, we use similar techniques where we take some characteristic and change that as a direct representation of, for example, speech coming out of somebody's throat or the intensity of light on a picture as we're scanning it. So these are all referred to as analog type circuits. For digital, the way that we like to start talking about digital is with digital carrier systems. And these were circuits that were specifically designed right from the beginning to carry numbers from one place to another. We looked briefly at T1 and Sonnet. These are both examples of digital circuits where we're using little pulses of electricity or pulses of photons to represent ones or zeros. Any type of local cabling system you can think of, like uh, LANs are digital. We use little pulses on the LANs. ISDN basic rate. This specifies doing little pulses on the local loop instead of analogs. This is a digital circuit. Our old friend RS-232 is a digital circuit. Just as we characterize the way that we represent information on circuits into analog and digital, so we characterize circuit terminating equipment. When somebody says that they're using analog techniques for transmission, what that means is that they're picking some characteristic of something that they can change on the physical circuit, like for example it's voltage, and they're changing that characteristic continuously as a direct representation of something else. This is called modulation. So the box at this end is a modulator. It's doing this on the line. The box at the other end is a demodulator. It's listening on the line trying to figure out is that supposed to be meeting a 1 or is that supposed to be meeting a 0 and spitting out 1s and zeros. 
Obviously, we want to have the boxes do both functions. You can talk in both directions. So they're called modulator slash demodulators, or modem for short. Modem is a nice word because it can be used to refer to any box that does that on the line. Sometimes we want to indicate at which frequencies it's doing that. Clearly voice band modems are boxes that do that within the frequency band supported by the public telephone network. We use the same techniques but at higher frequencies on radio and cable TV. Those boxes are often called RF modems, radio frequency modems, to indicate that they're doing this at a higher frequency. Now, when somebody says digital transmission, what they're supposed to be meaning is that we don't put a nice smooth wave on the line to represent ones and zeros. Instead, we do nice square pulses of something, like electricity or light. The square pulses that we put on the physical medium, that's not called modulation, that's called a digital line code. So a box that does pulses is not supposed to be called a modem. There's no such thing as a digital modem, that's an oxymoron. Those two words don't go together. Digital is digital, modulation is the analog technique. Unfortunately, there isn't one nice word to refer to digital data circuit terminating equipment. There's a list of them about this long, and you have to use the correct one. On T1 circuits, in course number two, we briefly looked at CSUs, channel service units. And then there are also DSUs, and there are CSU DSUs. On ISDN, you need a network termination type 1 device for basic rate interface. LANs are digital, so you need a piece of circuit terminating equipment. This is the LAN card plugged into your computer, the Ethernet card, and it physically terminates the wires and puts the pulses on them. That ain't called a modem, that's called a LAN card, an Ethernet card, or sometimes called a network interface card. So you have to use the appropriate term. There's not one word to refer to generically digital data circuit terminating equipment. And it's not modem. Now that said, you could go to your local computer superstore and they'd have a whole rack of digital modems for sale. What's going on there? Well, let's say that you work at some company like 3Com and the types in the back room come up with the stuff that you need to do ISDN basic rate. And let's say that you're in the marketing department. Your job is to get cold hard cash for this stuff. What are you going to call these little cards? Integrated services, digital network, basic rate interface, network termination type ones? <laughs> of course not. What are you going to call them? Digital modems. Hey, that sounds spiffy. They're digital. I bet we could charge extra for them. There's no such thing as a digital modem, but because there's not one nice word to refer to digital data circuit terminating equipment, people call them digital modems. Also, you should be aware if you deal with T1s that there is such a thing as a CSU, a DSU, and a CSU slash DSU, and there's specific definitions for these. Most people don't know those definitions, and they randomly refer to all three boxes as a CSU-DSU. Just smile and nod. Because no matter what you want to call these things, they all do the same function. This is the hardware that represents the ones and zeros in the physical medium. And you have to have the same stuff at each end. Now we'll take a look at some circuit configurations. Obviously the simplest example is when there are just two boxes. Usually the requirement is not to communicate just one bit, it's to communicate a group of bits, like say uh, eight, for example. 
If we had to communicate 8 bits between two boxes, we'd have a couple of choices. One choice would be to connect 8 circuits between the two boxes, represent one bit on each of the circuits, and then tell the other end to look at the circuits because the data is valid. That's called parallel because the circuits, if they're going to be in a cable, they will be in parallel. Or if they're on a piece of fiberglass, they're literally in parallel. The other choice is not to connect up eight circuits, but to connect up one. Now things inside computers are in parallel. So we might have a group of eight bits sitting inside this computer. To communicate that group of eight bits over one circuit, you need a piece of hardware. And this traditionally has been called a serial port. What the serial port actually is, is a chip. And historically, the Intel 8251 UART, Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter Chip, was the one that was used for serial ports. And one of the functions of this chip is to represent the bits in the group one after another in a sequence in time on the single circuit. And of course, you need another one of these chips at the other end to look at the circuit at the correct times to see whether it's a 1 or a 0 and turn it back into a group of 8 bits. We almost never do parallel communications. We almost always do serial communications. Why is that? Well, answer number one, money. Parallel, in this example, is eight times more expensive than serial. Not only do you have to have eight circuits, but you need to have eight line drivers and eight line receivers at each end. With serial, you just need one. Even the last few things that were parallel are being replaced with serial. Parallel printer cables are replaced with USB, universal serial bus. And one of the great advantages of that is that you can unplug the thing and plug it back in without having to restart your computer. Another parallel cable in your computer was to connect the hard drive onto the system board. And that was parallel ATA that's all being replaced with serial ATA. Pretty much everything is serial now. T1 is serial. LANs are serial. Sticking a modem on your phone line implements serial connections. Even uh, peripheral connections like for mice and keyboards, this is serial. Uh, all fiber systems are serial. So just remember, fiber is serial and serial has fiber. Words to live by. When we want to connect more than two boxes together, things start getting complicated. Here's a block diagram of a multi-drop circuit. And this is the traditional way that IBM mainframes were connected. And it's also a block diagram of a cable TV system. Let's use IBM mainframes to explain this. The idea is that we have users with dumb terminals, and model number 3270 was a very popular model of dumb terminal. And these users might be clustered together in rooms and buildings and different cities. And we have the computer in the computer room. And what we want to do is connect these clusters of users back together to the computer. The way that it was done was that we would take these clusters of dumb terminals and connect them to a terminal controller, or a cluster controller, or a remote terminal controller, whatever you want to call it. And we would take the mainframe and glue another computer on the front of it called a communication controller, or a front-end processor. And this thing was responsible for managing all the communications in and out of the mainframe. And then what we would do is connect the controllers together. We would pull a two-wire circuit out of the computer room and drop it into this location, but then continue it along and also drop it into this location and into this location. This is called a multi-drop circuit. It's a single circuit with multiple derivations coming off of it. Or if you want to look at it the other way around, it's a single circuit with multiple stations physically plugged onto it. 
Why would we connect stuff up in a multi-drop configuration like this instead of a multi-point configuration? Multi-point would be when everybody has their own access circuit. Well, answer number one, money. This is the cheapest way to wire this stuff up, especially if each of these things is in a different city. When we do this, however, it introduces a problem because that's a single circuit with multiple stations physically connected onto it. Whenever the main box says something, all of the boxes that are connected onto the circuit are going to hear what it's saying. So in addition to transmitting data, we have to also indicate for whom this data is intended, who should react to this data, because everybody's going to hear it. What name do we give to the piece of control information that we transmit on a circuit to indicate for whom a chunk of data is intended? An address. So in addition to sending a chunk of data, we also have to tack an address onto the front to say for whom this is intended. Going back into the computer room, we did something similar. We would pull a circuit from here to here and we would kind of piggyback this one on top of it and piggyback the third one on top of that. So this is like multi-drop out and multi-drop back, if you want to call it that. This introduces a different problem because we've got one circuit going into the computer room with three different computers, these controllers, connected onto it. Since there's just one circuit, only one of those computers can talk at a time. So we have to come up with a method for deciding who gets to talk next on that circuit going into the computer room. We need an access control mechanism. The mechanism that was used here was called polling. And the way it works, this is the master and these are the slaves. Or if you want to use more technical terminology, this is the primary station on the data link and these are the secondary stations on the data link. And the way it works is the primary station pulls the secondaries. So what it's going to do is it's going to say, hey, box number one, do you have anything to say? They'll say no. They'll say, okay, you be quiet. Box number two, do you have anything to say? Maybe somebody's just finished typing in a whole form on their IBM mainframe dumb terminal and press the send button on their terminal. What that means is that there's a whole screen full of data sitting in the remote controller waiting to go back to the mainframe. So this box is going to say, yes, yes, I have something to say. So the primary station will select it, giving it permission to transmit back to the mainframe. And then when it's finished, the mainframe communication controller will say, OK, you be quiet. Number three, do you have anything to say? This is called polling. What's the problem with using polling as an access control mechanism? Well, delays. This works fine if there are three secondary stations on the data link. It doesn't work at all if there are a million secondary stations on the data link. Poll number one, poll number two, poll number three, poll number 999,999, poll number one million. By the time you went back to poll number one again, it would have starved for lack of attention. So this technique is not really used for wiring up computers anymore. We tend to do this instead. What did I just do? Threw away the mainframe? Well, no, probably not. What we're going to do is take that very expensive, fast computer and move it down so it's at the same level as all of the others. What is this a picture of? This is called a LAN. When wiring things up inside an office building today, we tend not to have a controller and controllees because that's not scalable to large numbers of computers. We tend to just wire them all together and let them fight it out amongst themselves. And that's called a LAN. When these things were first developed, 
we used a bus and uh, in the lands module you will certainly go through the history of all of this stuff basically it was a cable that would be run in a suspended ceiling and all of the computers were plugged onto this cable lands are also called broadcast domains and the reason for this is because all of these computers are all connected together physically so they have the possibility of talking directly to each other or one talking directly to all of the others. It can broadcast directly to all of the other stations. Hence it's called a broadcast domain. As you might imagine, that has implications for network security. And in the advanced IP module, we're certainly going to go through the whole story of VLANs and IP subnets and how those go together and why we use LAN switches here and routers there. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. This is the introduction. In this picture, each computer needs a piece of digital data circuit terminating equipment, an adapter card that's plugged into the computer that physically terminates the wires. And this is called a LAN card, or an Ethernet card, or sometimes it's called a network interface card, a NIC. I like to avoid using the word network when talking about LANs. Because, now this is a bit academic, LANs, which stands for Local Area Network, they ain't. They're local area multi-drop circuits, or if we wire them all to a central box called a hub or a switch, it's a local area multi-point circuit. So they should be called LAMPs instead of LANs, but everybody calls them LAN, so we still will. But as we're going to see as we get deeper into this story, the only way you get a network is when you have to make a routing decision. When there are multiple different ways you could possibly send your data and you have to pick one of them and the data is routed that particular way. That's the definition of a network. Here, we're just wiring all the computers together and they can broadcast information to all of the others and there are no decisions going on as to which physical way that your data is going to go. When we wire things up like this, we have very similar problems to the ones in the last slide. All of these computers are all wired together. They can broadcast information directly from one to another. And if the way that this is wired up, if one computer sends something, all of the other computers are going to hear it. So again, we have to tack a little address onto the front of the data to say which computer is supposed to react to this data. All of them are going to receive it. And since they're all physically connected onto one circuit, that means that only one of them can talk at a time. So again, we have to come up with an access control mechanism. Who gets to talk next? We go through that whole story in the LANs DVD course. To give you the short answer, they have to fight it out amongst themselves in a contention-based access control mechanism. What each station does is listens on the cable to hear if anybody's transmitting. If nobody else is transmitting, then it can burst into song and start transmitting. The name for this protocol is called Carrier Sensing Multiple Access with Collision Detection. Anyways, these are just details. The basic idea with a LAN is that we wire everything together and the stations can communicate directly one to another. Hence, it's called a broadcast domain. A couple of other things on this chart, you notice that one of the connections to this cable is labeled uplink. What is that linking to? Well, the rest of the world. And it has to go through a box, which is on the next slide. The other thing that's labeled on here, it says bus now replaced with switch. LANs evolved. The first technology that was commercially deployed was called Ethernet. And this employed a cable called a bus cable and it would be in suspended ceilings. The next improvement on that was to take this bus cable and shrink it down to about that long and put it in a box and call the box a hub and then wire all of the network adapters in the PCs to this box. It's still the same picture, we just shrank the bus down to being about that long. Then the next improvement was to change this to a switch. And basically a LAN switch 
is a hub with a processor in it. And what it does is that the computer actually transmits its chunk of data with an address on the front and it gets intercepted by the processor in the switch. The processor in the switch looks at the address tacked onto the front of the data and then decides which computer that's actually for and just sends it to that one computer and not to all of the others. And as you might imagine, this can improve performance quite a bit. Instead of having 16 computers all connected onto the same cable, by plunking a switch in the middle, it makes it look like every computer has their own private cable. Not to be confused with a telephone switch, a circuit switch. This is a device that works on one chunk of data at a time. It's called a LAN switch, or as we'll see in the next course, number four, it's also called a layer two switch. Telephone switches are something completely different. They do circuit switching where it reserves a trunk circuit for the duration of the phone call. We use the same word here to mean directing chunks of data one at a time to the correct LAN card. There were other technologies for LANs originally. IBM had a scheme called Token Ring. That's now obsolete, and all of the technologies are in the Ethernet family, and it's actually a standard called 802.3 from the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. We cover all of the details in the LANs course. Where we're headed with this story is this picture. What we're saying here is that all of this stuff in this building, in this city, is connected together with LAN technology. Been there, done that. All of the stuff here is connected together with LAN technology. Been there, done that. All of the stuff in this building is connected with LAN technology. What we want to do now is to connect these buildings together so that somebody at, say, for example, a client computer in this building could access a server in that building. For reasons of availability, as much as anything else, we usually connect the buildings together with redundant paths, so that if this link gets busy, we can always go through the other building to get to where we want to go. As soon as we do that, you can see that a chunk of data coming off of the client computer on one side and through the LAN switch has to arrive at this box and then there's a decision that has to be made. Do we go this way or do we go this way to get to the desired computer? We have to make a route decision. What would be a good name for a box that makes route decisions? Well, how about a router, for example? Now, in some parts of North America, people say root instead of route. What is routing, anyway? Well, if you go to Sears, you can buy one of those things to finish the edge of a table. That's called routing the table. In a battle, if you make the enemy run away, that's called routing the enemy. Routing, well, if you're at a high school football game, you can root for the home team. Uh, truffle pigs root for truffles. If you've got a big silver maple tree in your front yard, sooner or later you're going to have to get one of those roto-rooters to remove the roots out of your drain. Either of these pronunciations, or either of these pronunciations, can be used to refer to the need to make a decision which way you're going to go when there are multiple possible choices. Now, the companies that make these boxes, and I'm thinking one in particular called Cisco of Mountain View, California, they call them routers. So I pretty much switched and I just use the term router all the time. Once we have this set up, we have to give this system some way of actually deciding which way do you go. The way that that works is we assign every one of the computers what's called a network address. And the world's most popular standard way of assigning network addresses is called IP version 4. So we would give every one of these computers an IP address, and the way it works 
is that when you want to send information from this computer to that computer, you take a chunk of information and you put the network address, the IP address of the destination on the front of your chunk of data. And this is called a packet. And then you send the packet over the local cabling, over the LAN to your router in your building. Your router brings in the packet and looks at the destination IP address and uses that as the basis of deciding do we go this way or that way. It's going to decide, well, we're going to go across here and it's sending it to the router in the other building. That one is again going to look at the destination IP address and use that to figure out which computer to give it to in the local building at the far end. In this course, we're going to go through the idea of packets and also frames, which is what I was alluding to talking about LANs just a minute ago, and how those ideas go together. And we'll go through the basics of IP packets and IP addressing. We go through the whole story of IP addressing in the advanced IP course and go through the routing protocols and how the routers actually route and how they stay up to date we go through that whole story. Now talking about IP is interesting. Well, at least I find it interesting anyway. But that's not the expensive part of this story. What's the expensive part of this story? Buying software that knows how to format IP packets, that's called Windows, and buying boxes that know what to do with those, that's called a router, those are one-time purchases every two and a half years. But the stuff in the middle, the circuits, that's a recurring charge month after month, year after year. Like, let's say, for example, that we were going to use dedicated T1s, you know, fairly obsolete technology, but it's an easy example. We were going to use dedicated T1s to connect these three locations together. How much does a dedicated T1 cost between Los Angeles and New York? Well, if you were really lucky and got a deal, that would be $1,500 a month. Month after month, year after year. And that's just for one circuit. Somebody in the accounting department is going to add that up and say, wait a minute. You're talking about spending 4500 times twelve, $50,000 a year? for three circuits? So yeah, talking about IP routers and routing and things like that, that's fun, but that's not the expensive part of this story. We have to spend time talking about the expensive part, and that's the circuits in the middle. We'll briefly mention using dedicated lines, and in theory, you could make phone calls to connect these buildings together. That was called ISDN. What we really want to talk about are bandwidth on demand packet based services from the phone company to connect those locations together. And the idea of virtual circuits instead of real circuits. That's where we're headed with this story. In this part, we're going to go through the way that information is formatted to be transmitted on data circuits and across networks. And this is a little bit painful, but you know what they say, no pain, no gain. Let's start at the beginning with bits. Everybody knows what a bit is. That's a one or a zero. Actually, that wasn't the original definition of the term bit. Originally, bit was used as a unit of measurement of how much information you had to communicate. Just like uh, we measure the amount of beer you've got in fluid ounces or milliliters, we measured how many thoughts you had in bits. And then the computer science people came to life and said, hey, what a neat word, and stole it to mean logic levels, one, zero, inside their boxes. And to this day, information theorists refuse to call these things bits. They call them binary digits. Anyway, that's all been lost in the mists of time. 
As far as we're concerned, a bit is a one or a zero. It doesn't really matter where it's living or what it's doing. Everybody knows what a byte is, that's eight bits. Usually we end up transmitting these things serially. So we send one bit at a time. Now if you get unlucky in this life, you end up having to discuss with somebody else which bit within the byte is being transmitted at a particular time. And if you get really, really unlucky, you end up having to read the standard for the communication system that you're using, and it'll say something like, we transmit bit one down the line first. Then you start getting a headache because you start thinking, are they calling it bit one because that's the one they transmit down the line first, but it's actually this one over here. And as you might imagine, there were arguments. IBM did it one way, DEC did it the other way. They were not compatible. You could not transmit information from an IBM mainframe to a VAX because they didn't agree on what bit one was. To avoid this problem, it's better to give them names. If we call this one the least significant bit, this would be the one that has the lowest numeric value. If you were counting, it would change very often. And if we call this one the most significant bit, that one has the highest numeric value. And if you're counting, it would not change very often. Then there's no confusion as to which end of the byte you're talking about when we're transmitting them. And you might think that this is not important, but actually I was reading the standard for DSL. It's about that thick. And there was a paragraph that long where they were trying to explain which bit got transmitted first in DSL. And I read it through several times and I could not understand what they meant. What can we do with these things? Well, we can represent information using bytes. Often we group information into control and data. Examples of control information, instructions going back and forth over a data circuit between a client and server. These are all coded into bytes. All of the instructions inside a computer are all coded into bytes. As far as data goes, we often divide that between keystrokes and quantities. For keystrokes, we can use bytes to tell somebody else which button you just pressed on your keyboard. For quantities, we tend to use the binary numbering system. And we might put together a few bytes, say for example, use 16 bits in a row. And what that means is you can represent a whole number between 0 and 2 to the 16th minus 1 using that technique. And then there are all sorts of variations for representing negative numbers and decimals and so forth. Very briefly, we'll take a look at one of the techniques for representing which button you pressed on the keyboard. Here's a short form chart showing the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, ASCII. This is a method of telling somebody else which button you pressed on your computer using a sequence which is seven bits long. You can see, for example, the ASCII code for an A is 1000001. The ASCII code for a capital B is 1000010. The ASCII code for a capital C is 1000011. Or 41 in hexadecimal, 42 in hexadecimal, and 43 in hexadecimal, for those of you who know hexadecimal. Everybody on the planet uses ASCII to tell each other which button they pressed on their keyboard, or a variation thereof, except IBM. On IBM mainframes, they don't use ASCII, they use EBCDIC, the Extended Binary Coded Decimal Interchange Code code set. I think they must have a department that thinks up these names because if, if you reflect on it for a few months, you'll wake up one morning and say, yes, that's perfect name. It's exactly what they're doing. It's the Extended Binary Coded Decimal interchange code code set. Now what's the difference between EBCDIC and ASCII? 
nothing to the same thing. Well, if we were going to look at an EBCDIC chart, which we're not going to waste our time doing, it would be exactly the same as this one, except it would be twice as big, upside down, backwards, and none of the characters would be the same. Other than that, they're exactly the same thing. It's a standard way of telling somebody else which button you pressed on the keyboard, and it doesn't really matter which one you're using, as long as the other end knows which one you're using. We have to have agreement on how we're coding our thoughts into ones and zeros. Has it ever happened to you that you were looking at something that maybe had been sent over the internet and you printed it and instead of having nice box drawing characters it came out with O's with umlauts and U's with umlauts all the way around instead of box drawing characters? That's because bytes are 8 bits long. But if you look at this chart, you'll see that the American Standard Code for Information Interchange specifies 7 bit long characters. If we were to extend ASCII to make it 8 bit long character codes, that would mean that the chart is twice as big. There'd be a whole other half of the chart. What lives in this other half? Well, those are all the box drawing characters and E's with accents and O's with umlauts. The problem is that there's no agreement on what lives in the other half of this chart because the standard is seven bits long. In fact, there are hundreds of variations of what lives in the other half of that chart. For example, somebody who lives in Norway might have set their computer's operating system so that when they press a particular key that's labeled with an O with a slash through it, it generates this particular 8-bit long code representing that key. But you can be certain that somebody who lives in France does not agree that that 8-bit long code means an O with a slash through it. They think it means an E with an accent above it. And so the person in Norway creates these codes, sends them to the person in France, and everywhere there's supposed to be an O with a slash, and E with an accent comes out instead. We're slowly but surely fixing this problem, coming up with standards, and you'll see ISO standards for character sets. And what we do is use a standard called MIME, which we talk about in course number five, the internet course, to tag the front of a message to say what standard was used to create these 8-bit codes so that you can turn them back into characters properly. Using ASCII to code our information ends up creating a byte to represent a button being pressed on a keyboard. To then transmit that across a circuit, we have to do error detection and we have to do framing on that. The reason why we have to do error detection is because there's no such thing as an error-free circuit. We're always going to have some errors happening. And we have to have a way of doing error detection and then error correction. There's always some sort of protocol in place for doing error detection and error correction. Like right here, right now, there's an error control protocol in place on the words that I'm speaking. You might imagine that some of this stuff took a few takes before it came out right. And what's happening is that my brain is doing error detection on the words that are coming out of my mouth. How am I doing this error detection? Well, I'm using syntax and context to decide whether what I'm saying makes sense or not. And if were I to speak starting like Yoda, then my brain would be listening to this and saying, wait a minute, that violates the syntax rules. And so I would stop and say it again. So when we're doing speech, the way that we correct errors is by detecting them using syntax and context and then correcting them by retransmitting, saying it again. Unfortunately, in data communications, there might not be any context in what you're transmitting. That could be a digitized image, a JPEG of modern art. Or even worse, it could be an email message that we have encrypted for security reasons, which actually removes all the context. So you can't tell what it is. 
So we always have to add some extra stuff to the data to be able to detect whether errors happened at the other end. The original design for sending keystrokes was we would code them into ASCII and send them one at a time and the error detection was on each keystroke. It was one bit that was added to the keystroke called a parity bit. This is why ASCII was seven bit long codes. You had seven bits of data and one bit of error checking to fill up the whole byte. And if you're interested to see how parity checking works, you can look in the appendix of the workbook for this course. It's pretty close to being obsolete now, so we've moved it out of the main part of the course. In addition to doing error detection and correction, we also have to do framing. And what this is, is putting brackets around the data, marking the beginning and the end, so that when we send it over a data circuit, the far end knows where the data starts and stops. And the original design for this was we put a single bit at the beginning called a start bit and a single bit at the end called a stop bit. And we transmitted this whole thing to the far end and they were always looking for the start bit and stop bit. When they saw them, they knew that everything inside was good and everything outside was, well, we don't care. People used to call the idea of coding a keystroke into one byte and doing the error detection and framing on the byte and then transmitting it as asynchronous. And you hear people talking about asynchronous ports on this and that. What does asynchronous mean? Well, not synchronous. It's some sort of weird Greek Latin fusion. Asynchronous, not with the clock. It means it's not a timed transfer of information. If you've got a keyboard, you can waltz up to the keyboard and press a key whenever you feel like it. Right? Nobody's saying, ready, set, go, press a key. Another way of thinking about what asynchronous means is not from the transmitter's point of view, but from the receiver's point of view. There's no way for the receiver to predict when the next keystroke is going to arrive. That could happen in a tenth of a second or tomorrow morning. A third way of thinking about what asynchronous means if you're doing asynchronous communication of information, what are you normally doing, statistically speaking, most of the time? What are you normally doing with your keyboard? What are you normally doing with your telephone? Nothing. It's just sitting there while you stare out the window. That's what asynchronous means. Normally you're doing nothing with your communication circuit and then randomly, whenever you feel like it, you can transmit some data and then go back to doing nothing again. That's what asynchronous means. People used to call the idea of transmitting one keystroke at a time asynchronous. But that's not very accurate. It should be called a type of asynchronous communications because there are many other things we can transmit asynchronously than single keystrokes. This business of coding one keystroke into a byte and doing the error detection and the framing around that with start bits, stop bits, and parity bits, and then sending them one at a time is almost completely obsolete. If you've got a dial-up modem, then it's still happening there because the serial port, and whether it's plugged onto the serial port on your computer or it's a built-in modem card, it has a serial port chip on there, the serial port does this and you can't turn it off. The problem with this, though, of course, is overhead. What we've got is seven bits of information being transmitted. What does it cost us? Three bits of overhead. Three out of seven, that's almost 50% overhead. Or three out of 10, if you want to count it that way, 30% overhead. And also, the error detection doesn't really work very well. There's got to be a better way.
As much as possible, we try not to send one byte at a time and do the framing and error detection on a per byte basis because of the obvious problems with overhead and also the error detection doesn't really work when we're doing it one byte at a time. What we do try to do is gather together a whole bunch of bytes and send them all together as a block. And then we can do the framing and the error detection on a per block basis rather than on a per byte basis. Now remember we were talking about multi-drop circuits where when you sent some data multiple stations would receive it so that you had to indicate for whom it was intended and the way we did this was to tag a little address at the front then we might also have sequence numbers. If we're sending multiple blocks of data, we want to put sequence numbers on them so that we can reconstruct whatever we're sending properly. The collection of all of this stuff, the framing, the address, the control information like sequence numbers, the actual data and the error checking, this whole thing is called a frame. The framing is called a flag, and in the simplest case, it's a byte at each end. And the error detection is called a frame check sequence. Sometimes you'll hear people referring to the error detection on these things as ACRC. That's not exactly correct. It's actually a frame check sequence. It's like 16 or 32 or 48 bits and it's added to the data at the transmitter and it's used to check it at the receiver. The whole process of adding it and checking it is called cyclic redundancy checking, but the thing that's actually on the data is called a frame check sequence. Well, that's not such a heinous error. We'll let them get away with that one. IBM used this technique on mainframe computers way back and they called this synchronous communications. So in the old days, sending one byte at a time was called asynchronous, and sending blocks was called synchronous. These are words that you should just delete from your vocabulary and not use. We should not call this synchronous communications because that term is used for many other things, like say, for example, synchronous time division multiplexing. It has nothing to do with this idea. And also, we can transmit these things asynchronously. Now, the correct term for this is to call this thing a frame and to discuss broadcasting frames to other stations on the same physical circuit. And just in case anybody has trouble sleeping at night, we included the mathematical proof of how cyclic redundancy checking works in the workbook for this course. All you do, if you're having trouble getting to sleep and you're tossing and turning and flipping like a fish, you just open the workbook to that notes page and go through the mathematical derivation of how CRC works. I guarantee you'll drift off halfway through. The other reason for including this is because this is the main reason for doing frames, is the error detection. The idea is that on a multi-drop circuit, we've got a chunk of data we want to send from computer A to computer F. And we take the chunk of data and put the destination address in the front, that would say F. Often we put the source address on there as well and we put a reliable error detection mechanism on there and we put some framing around it and then transmit the whole thing out onto the circuit. Everybody receives it, they check the error check because it protects the address and then they look at the destination address and if it's not for them they're supposed to ignore it. If it is for them then they actually take the data out of there and do something with it. If it fails the error check then we have to retransmit it. And what we do is keep retransmitting it until it gets there. And when this is all said and done, what we've done is moved that block of data from computer A to computer F on the same physical circuit, and we know that there are no errors in that data.
So that's what frames are, is a chunk of data with framing and error detection and an address that goes across a circuit to which both computers are physically attached. Now let's talk about packets. Packets are a completely different idea that have nothing to do with frames. Packets go with networks. The definition of a network is that some organization, and whether it's the phone company or your organization, it's the same story, some organization is going to get network equipment, like routers from Cisco, and put these in buildings in different cities and connect them internally with high capacity circuits. This is the network. And then we provide access to these high capacity circuits to users. Now let's say for example we're an insurance company and we're going to use a network provided by AT&T, just for example. When we send a chunk of data in over the access circuit to AT&T's 